So just to introduce myself, because I have met many of you, but not all of you. So my name is Amy Smith, and I took Debbie's place when she resigned at the end of August. So I've been with the ANA and the BCNS for about two years um, as Debbie's uh, assistant and coordinator. And then I stepped into her role when she stepped down. And so Megan Rafael is also joining us, and she took my place when I took Debbie's place. So she is my assistant. She's there to answer questions. Um, she's there to help with any paperwork issues, um, portal issues, anything like that. So please always feel free to email either of us, and we'll make sure our emails are in the chat as well. Um, so if questions arise, <clears throat> excuse me, after this or any time, please, you know, know that we are, you know, have an open door policy and more than welcome to set up meetings or con conversate over email or anything that you all need. And then Tracy's also here. I don't know if, if, if she was having trouble logging in, so I just want to make sure that she got logged in. So Tracy is our, there she is, director of, of, of uh, advocacy and legislative affairs. So she's also here to answer any questions that anyone might have. Before I get started on the walking through the tracker, is there any pre-tracker questions that anyone has? I know the biggest question we've had so far is what, you know, when do candidates need to switch to this new tracker? So if they started their supervision in September or later, they're expected to use this new tracker. If they were a candidate before that time, they're more than welcome to finish their their uh, SPE hours with the old tracker, or they can also transfer over to the new tracker if they would like to. The new tracker in, um, has room for a lot of details, which a lot of the candidates are liking. So if some of them have asked if they could change over and that's absolutely fine with us. If they were a candidate prior to September of this year, they would still you know, be able to turn in the checkmark tracker and the old candidates report. And if they want to end up using both, that's fine too, until we get everyone transferred over to this new one as time goes on. So um, so there's no requirement, but they are absolutely more than welcome to switch over if they want to. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Like I said, please feel free to ask questions as we go through. So this, can everyone see that? Okay, perfect. So this is the new tracker. It is laid out in Excel format. This one document is taking place of the old checkmark tracker and the candidate report. So everything is in this document. So they will technically, if they've started their supervision in September or later, technically they only have to turn in one document. That's even if they had more than one supervisor. So, um, you know, before we required a different tracker for each supervisor, and that's no longer uh, the case. So really, they would only have one document at the end of their supervision. So we're trying to streamline the process for them and for us on our end. So the first tab, this red tab is instructions. I'm not going to read through all of that. Hopefully everyone has or will. Um, and it just kind of walks through what we're expecting and the very technical uh, details of how to fill it out. If there's any confusion in the instructions, please reach out. Um, we've given details about how to record the time. So in 15 minute increments, um, and some very vague details about the, the categories. And so if there's future questions on the categories, please make sure you reach out about that. And there is a link in here that links to the website that talks specifically about the breakdown of observational versus direct. The second tab is gonna be their summary page. So this is going to be all of the details that used to be at the top of the old candidate report. So they're going to fill out their contact information, their business information, if it's applicable, um, or their employment information. The breakdown of the hours is going to auto-populate. So as they fill out the hours tracking log, it's going to auto-populate into, um, into this area. They shouldn't have to do anything, but it should give them a, glam a, a glimpse at any moment how many hours they have at that time. We did separate out the observational hours because there is a cap of 250 observational hours, so that way they can see how many hours they are at in the observational part, but the observational does go into the total hours. So it's just separated out really for them to be able to see where they're at and make sure they're not going over that 250 hours. It has a space for their supervisor information. If this is a supervision group, they do not have to list out every supervisor. So if you work for, um, for a supervising group that has multiple supervisors, they can just put the name of the supervision group. That's absolutely fine. And it's going to have an area for them to break down their hours. 
So they can use the tracking log. There is a filtering tool on the actual tracking log so they can look at it by supervisor. And so they'll have to use this, that tool to put the hours in here. It's not gonna auto populate, but I'll kind of show you how that works on the tracking log. So there's room for four supervisors. If they have additional ones there, you know, they can definitely add them below. Um, the old tracker required signatures by the candidate and the supervisor. The supervisor no longer has to sign this document. So you're, you're signing the supervisor report and only that. So when you sign that, there is a check mark, you know, that you're signing off on their hours. And so that we're no longer requiring signatures on both documents. And just to save the hassle of trying to put a signature into Excel, we are allowing them to type their signature in, just knowing that it is binding, even if it is typed and not signed. And so hopefully that helps with some of those issues that we've had with people having to sign or not being able to sign into with the Excel and turning it into a huge PDF and all of that. So the next tab is going to be the SPE guidelines. And so we've laid out here exactly what counts as observational, direct, and what does not count for hours. So um, I, one of the questions that comes up quite often is what category does time spent with a supervisor count in? And it is, it, it is its own category. So if they are spending an hour with you talking over cases, it's going to go in the, the line for time spent with a supervisor. It's not going to go into categories A, B, or C. It is separate, but it does count for the 1,000 hours. So I'll show you how that looks on the tracking log. And then um, we clearly laid out what doesn't uh, qualify for SPE. So it might be a great refresher for everyone to look over what does count and what doesn't count in each category. The next tab is the candidate's responsibilities. And we used to have this on the candidate's report, which was great, except for then we were asking them to sign off on responsibilities after they were done with everything. So now our expectation is that they're looking at this at the beginning. So they know what our expectations are and the responsibilities are throughout their SPE. So this is, they can um, literally just pick from the drop down. yes, we're, ex we're, we're expecting them to answer yes to all of them, but knowing their responsibilities when they're going in, as opposed to the end when they're filling out that final report is really important. So we just wanna make sure they're reading over that when they get started. So the next tab is the actual hours tracking log. So there is examples put in here and I'm gonna go through a couple of them and this might be where some questions come up. So again, please feel free to jump in. Um, the expectation is that they are including as much detail as possible. We're not looking for them to write a paper on it, but we do wanna know what they're doing. We wanna see that they know um, how to handle different uh, health conditions, that they are following the competencies. So really, you know, um, suggesting and, you know, um, really helping them understand that the more details they have and better for them and for us when we're reviewing it. And also when they go to state licensing boards, the more detail they have, the better. So um, and just looking at some of the, um, the categories, so we have the date. So it might be a requirement that they use multiple lines for one day based on what they did. So in the example, we have four things that happened on June 6th, and that's totally fine. It's great for them to break it down that way so they can see the different clients that they worked with. There's an opportunity to put the supervisor in. So um, as you create supervisors in here, you put their names, it will allow you to filter them, and I'll show everyone how that works in just a moment. Um, we want them to put a description of their clinical work and activity. And so again, we want details. We want to know, was it an intake? We want to know, was it a follow-up? Um, having them put their client initials will be great for you to look at this document compared to their notes. So you know who, you know what correlates with each other, putting in um, sex or gender or whatever is applicable and their age, and then really putting in the details of what they did. You know, for example, in this top example, we educated on inflammation and hypertension and RA, recommended supplements and anti-inflammatory diet plan, and then research rheumatoid arthritis. So we're not giving you know, an entire health history in here, but we do want to know what the candidate did for that hour of their time. Um, the next column, we'll let them put in where they did that work. So it could be if, you know, if you have your own clients and the, the uh, candidates coming there to do their work, it might be the name of your business. It might be the name of their business. It might be a school name. So it just depends on, you know, on the candidate there. And that's really just for them to kind of track uh, where it took place. And then the next thing we want to look at is it indirect, I mean, I'm sorry, is it independent or direct and direct, or is it observational? So if it's an independent hour, they can just put an X there because we're not totaling those up. 
Um, the observational, on the other hand, they're going to put an, an amount of hours in there. So the reason that they want to do that is because we want to make sure they're not going over the 250 hours. On the old tracker, it was really hard for them to compute that. So this is really just a way for us to mark, you know, independent, fantastic, we just put an X. If it's observational, we want to put the actual amount of hours so we can tell that when we're looking at their summary. If they put something in column F as observational, they still have to put the hours separated out between categories A, B, and C. So no matter what they mark in E or F, that's still going to be broken down into these two, these three categories. So, you know, if if the um if the activity is direct, great, they put the X and they separate the hours among the, the different categories. If it's observational, they would put, you know, for the example on line seven, they would put three hours, but then they would break it down into the different categories. So these these do not add up together. Um, it's not double dipping. It's just helping us look at, you know, how many observational hours they have. So it's going to allow them to put it, you know, just put how many hours they did in, in each category. So that's much different than the check mark system. But we still want to see their competencies being met through this description of activities. So, you know, those are the things, the things that we they were putting check marks on before are the things that we're still looking for details on. And so that as a supervisor, that might be great to explain to them. That it's you know just because we're not doing the check marks anymore doesn't mean that's not what we're still looking looking at. Um, column J is so they can add health conditions and um, you know this is kind of you know, that they're able to add in here. It's not any uh, certain health conditions, but this helps us to see that their experience is well rounded. So you know we want a candidate to do more than just work on GI. We want them to have a well rounded well rounded experience in MNT covering several different health conditions. And so this um, column J lets us see that in a snapshot that this this candidate definitely worked within several areas and wasn't just focused in one area or health condition. Column K is going to subtotal automatically based on what you put in A, B, and C. And then column L is that time with your supervisor. So if they have a one-on-one -on -one with you, they would put that in there, and then the hours are going to total in column M. So just looking at a couple of the examples, um, you know, example one, we can tell that this was, excuse me, a female age uh, 36. They did an, uh, an IC with prep and an assessment. You know, we talked through that one. The next one, their um, client's initials was a male 47. They did a follow-up with prep and session. They updated their interventions and they're working on neurotransmitter imbalance. And so when you go back, with, you know, and look at the cases with the, the candidate, this is a great time for you to compare their notes with what they have in the tracker itself. Um, any questions on that? Any questions on the, the actual tracking piece? I have a question, Amy, regarding the hours with supervisor. Do they have to describe what was discussed or can they just say met one on one with supervisor or met in a small group with supervisor? Great question. So we want them to put those details in there. So it doesn't have to be, you know, very it doesn't have to like it doesn't have to be a book, but we'd love to see um, time with supervisor. And I'm sorry that this isn't an, an example and I should add that so it'll be in here. Um, time with supervisor discussed case KR uh, supervisor suggested I try this supplement instead. It doesn't have to be a lot of detail, but we'd love to see what you discussed and how you know how meeting um, together either changed their intervention or you know that their intervention was great and that the supervisor loved it. That those are details we'd like to see as well. And that's not something at this point that we have really had the details on. So that that's good from our our stance to see how they're meeting the competencies. And really how they're doing in their supervision with you. Wendy, go thank ahead. You. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're fine. Sorry, Elizabeth. Did I answer? I just you? wanted to say thank you, but I, I had a slight follow-up question to sure. that. Oh, go ahead. So what if it, what if it's a group supervision and it's not their case? Is that okay, or would it be problematic so they would that it's be, marked as direct experience? So if the time of supervisor, if they're talking about other people, like are we talking about like Grand rounds or what well, are they? So, like an example would be two. I have two interns at the same site, and I meet with them for an hour. And for part of it, one of them is talking about their clients, and the other part, the other one's talking about their clients that they're seeing 
at the same facility. That's fine. Yeah. So that, that would still be time with supervisor. What doesn't count is if they're having a group session that's just education-based. So for like, for example, on line nine, if they're just having a group, if you're having an educational session with say six interns and you're talking about keto diet and it has nothing to do with their current clients, they cannot count it for hours. So anything that you're discussing needs to be applicable applicable to their client. Now, that is not the same um, thing as having a one-on-one -on -one with them to discuss their cases. This would be like educational pieces that's not directly correlated to their clients. Okay, and you still would want that? that example that you have on line nine documented, even though it doesn't count. For no, hours. we just put that in there to show that it wouldn't count for hours. That, that does, if it doesn't count for hours, it does not need to be in here. We just put that example in here to show that that education purely for the sake of education, while great for the candidate does not count for hours. It needs to, the, the education piece needs to relate directly to their client. Got it. Thank you, Amy, no for the clarification. And sorry, Wendy, that I took. Oh. No, it's fine. It's, those are good questions, actually. Um, so thank you, Amy. Um, two questions. Okay. One is you said that the supervisor hours are um, calculated separately, but they do account toward the hours. Are they counting toward observational hours or toward their regular hours? Just their regular hours. So it wouldn't count against them on their observational hours. They could still okay. have their 250 plus their time with their supervisor. That's absolutely okay. fine. So it doesn't really count in either category. So if they fill their 250 observational hours, the whatever's what the you know, supervisor would still be above and beyond that on the regular part of their 1,000. Yes. Okay. So here's my question now is that if we have, you know, a, a current, you know, current patients or current clients in the clinic and um, the student is reviewing current um, clients that are not theirs, but reviewing all of their cases, um, and then we discuss them in a supervisor setting, like, you know, she might take a current um, patient and do, you know, kind of like, what would you, what would you have done in this situation? Okay, now let's sit and talk about how her follow-ups went, went and we have a, you know, let's see how that goes. How would that count? Would that be observational? It would be observational because she, because that candidate's not working directly one-on-one -on -one <laughs> with their client. So if it is your client, it's observational. If it is their client, it is direct. Okay. So even if she's not sitting in directly on the visit, if we, if she's getting all, you know, looking at the notes, drawing up her own conclusions, we're discussing it, that, that counts. Okay, great. And Tracy, if you want to jump in there, am I, is that, am I correct in saying that in your understanding? I'm sorry, you're going to have to repeat that. If, if the, if the candidate is sitting in, I'm not sitting in on necessarily on the, the observing the client, but they're discussing current client cases with the supervisor and talking about options for treatment plans, it would be observational. Um, but we're, we're saying that she's not necessarily sitting in on the actual session She's just looking at the case after the fact. And even maybe putting her own, like drawing up her own treatment plan, how she would have done it. And then we discuss it. I can't make any guarantees about how licensing boards are going to view yeah. that, but that sounds, that sounds logical to me. You know, I, what I've seen is the interpretation of direct experience. Licensing boards are looking for direct experience between the supervisee and a client or patient with a specific condition. Yeah, the reason so I want to add that and, so 750 have to be direct. They do. And the reason I want to bring Tracy in is just from the state licensing piece. So I can speak to the BCNS piece that would absolutely count for an observational hour. Okay. Now we cannot guarantee that when they went to a licensing board that they would say the same thing. So okay. that's just why I wanted to get Tracy's input on that. But as far as the BCNS is, um, is considered, you know, that is an observational hour. As long as they are then creating some sort of treatment plan, you're talking through it. Mm -hmm. And they're gaining the, the, you know, the, the education piece and the clinical piece from it. Okay. Excellent. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Eleonora. Hey, hi, Amy. Hi. Uh, how's everybody? Good. So how do you record the um, uh, community education when the student uh, prepares for uh, like a specific uh, topic that they want to educate uh, the community? So I would record it the same way. They're just going to put in that description community. I would very clearly put community in there in the wording, um, okay. activity, community, education. 
Now, um, the main thing to keep in mind is that it counts for hours as long as it is within their client base. So doing like a community presentation at the Senior Citizen Center on diabetes absolutely counts for hours. The things that wouldn't count for hours would be if they did like a Facebook post about. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. yeah, yeah. No, no. So I would, they can just put it in the description. I would put, you know, community activity and, you know, what they did, perhaps their, um, their targeted group. Is it a program? Kind of just give us, give us some brief details about it. Okay, excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. So, Amy, just to clarify that, if, if they talk to a senior citizen group, but there's nobody there that's their client. It's just a group. That's still direct hours. They would be considered their clients in that case. It, it, okay. You know, if they're going and talking to those people. Those would be considered their clients in that moment. Okay. Are they? Are they oh, technically? Yeah. You know, like their actual like coming to their you know to their office or anything? Probably not. But in that moment, those people that they are that they are educating would be their clients. So in that 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 would count for direct um, okay. hours. And like I said, the only thing that wouldn't would be if they were like doing a Facebook Live that was geared at senior citizens, but it wasn't like them in a room talking to them personally. Okay, thank you. So, so just thinking out of the box a little bit with that, um, if if a clinician has five thousand subscribers to a YouTube channel, and these followers that subscribe to their channel are learning on all a variety of health topics, like, the, like diabetes, like metabolic, mm -hmm. whatever, help healing the gut. Um, all those things are kind of trackable, right, on the, the back end dashboard of a studio with, with YouTube. Um, that does not count as no. direct. Them, them creating um, assets for social media would not count. And I, I absolutely get what you're saying. Like they're obviously reaching a large group of people, um, but it's not that intimate group of people. It's it's a large mass audience that, that would not count for hours. Okay. So, so doing a live, a live session in a library or in a clinician counts but doing a live Zoom doesn't count. Oh well, it could have the Zoom could absolutely you know count if you're doing a virtual webinar. Absolutely, I'm just saying that producing a large you know um, like a social media thing that's going just going out to the general public does not count. Okay, so doing a privately set up session for educational purposes on Zoom counts. Sure. But doing the same thing on a Facebook Live through social media does not count. Correct. Correct. Okay. I understand. And so then all of the prep that they're doing for that particular community education would also be part of it? Sure. And they also need to be talking to their supervisor about that too, okay. right? So that's part of the supervision. If they're if they're creating um, you know, a one hour presentation at the Senior Citizen Center and they're doing prep and they're doing research and they're preparing handouts. They absolutely need, you know, the prep and all of that counts, but they also need to be talking to their supervisor. So that needs to be included in what the one-on-ones or however you're setting it up, that they're going through what they're doing, who their audience is, the tools that they're creating so that it's still clinically relevant and they're still getting supervision on that piece. So then I could have, you know, like my patient population, we could schedule a webinar with one of our interns and she, they can sign up for this webinar on diabetes she does a whole presentation. She presents, this is to our actual clinic population. That's okay. That's great. I didn't. Yes. And that, that brings us to another great question that we get a lot of the time is the research piece. So research for the sake of researching does not count for hours. So somebody wants to research, you know, research um, about diabetes to make a handout, but they don't have any clients with diabetes right now. It does, you know, it's great for their education, but it doesn't count for hours. We need things to be created for current clients. So research for, you know, writing a manuscript or writing a research paper, all of those things are great skills to have and they're great education pieces, but they don't count for hours if they're not doing them directly for their client base. Tracy, I, I saw you unmuted. Do you have something to add? 
Uh, I just wanted to add a little bit on the community nutrition piece that came up a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. um, that is not, and I just want to make sure I'm clear on this, and so is everyone else. Um, BCNS does not currently require community nutrition hours, but some states do. And I don't think this form separately tracks them, but you are going to want to notate community in the description of the activity so that you can keep track of those hours because there are states that do require them. And Florida is one that comes to top of mind. They require 200 community nutrition hours. And increasingly the council there looks at any one-on-one -on -one hours as clinical nutrition versus community. So we just wanna flag that for you all. It's not a BCNS requirement, but make sure you um, have your supervisees look at their state requirements because if they do want to be licensed in Florida, for example, they're going to need those community nutrition hours and we prefer to let them know up front so that they can earn those uh, before getting their credential. And just to add on to that, you know, there all the states have different laws, of course, that, you know, to, to look at, but if you have candidates that are in Florida or North Carolina, please have them reach out to us immediately because we have liaisons um, in each of those states that work with them to make sure they have the proper uh, paperwork from the beginning, as opposed to, you know, after they're done with their hours and then they try to go apply. So no matter where they're at in the process, please have them get in touch with myself or Megan so we can get them in touch with the liaisons for each of those states to make sure that they have the appropriate paperwork um, and are on the right track. Um, and those are the only two states that we have that in right now, but um, just, you know, just make sure if you do have them in those states, let us know. Um, Melissa? Thank you. Um, I, sorry, I um, hopped on late and I have to leave a little bit early. So I had one question directly related and one that's not related. Okay. Um, the first one is, are, is this being, oh, it is being recorded. Okay, so that actually answered that. I see that. Never mind. Um, <laughs> just so I can see some of the parts I missed um, later. The other question is, um, actually related to um, the naturopathic medicine, the, the board exams. Um, so I, I've had students say that they now have the option of taking the CNS exam along with their boards. Is Are they confusing it or is that accurate? accurate? I'm not sure what you're at. Um, you'll have to be more specific. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what the question is. The, the CNS certification exam, mm -hmm. are they able to take that? Like, is that sandwiched in with their board exams? Is that something or no, is that- it, they, they have to meet the, the, the requirements. So it's yeah. a good chance that they meet the requirements based on their coursework, but they would have to meet the coursework requirements. It, it, it's a completely separate thing. Okay, but it's, it's so it's not scheduled in that same timing with that, right? No, no, not okay, at all. Okay, then I'll have to figure out what they're talking about because they're yeah. like, it's the CNS thing. And I'm like, I don't know. Okay, so, all right. Thank you. Let me know if you have any further any questions on that, or if you need to put them in touch with me, I'm happy to answer questions, but I'm not sure that that doesn't sound familiar they, to me at all. I, I don't, I have to get more details. It was just okay. like a, yeah, but I, they know that they have to get their supervised hours first and get it approved, but so we'll have to talk about it and figure out what that is. Okay. So, and so they don't have to, in order to take the exam, they don't have to have their hours. So that seems to be a big misconception that's coming up now too, is that they can take their exam at any point after graduating, as long as they meet the coursework requirements. And this is anyone, NDs or anyone. The only suggestion is that we see people do better on the exam when they have completed the majority of their hours. So it is not a requirement that they finish all of the hours before they take the exam. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And starting the hours, um, start as, if they choose to, as soon as they start a master's program? Technically, yes, but we do suggest that they have their um, basic nutrition courses in first, because obviously we can't be treating people when we don't have the education to do so. So while they technically can start their hours when they're matriculated into the program, um, most, I would say most people are ready to start getting observational hours at that point, but definitely not ready for their direct hours as they don't have the clinical experience. Thank you. Rebecca? Thanks. I had a question about pre-counting hours. I had asked Debbie a question about this a long time ago, and the way she described it to me was that if an intern who starts working with us for supervision starts a project, say they start developing a group education program, um, you know, for diabetes or what have you, and then 
they're working on that and then they start a supervision program as long as they are vetting that project with the supervisor they can pre-count hours i didn't know if there was any change with that if there's a limitation on pre-counting hours or what that might look like so in that circumstance it would be up to you the supervisor is essentially signing off right if, if you're okay with them counting those hours from that program then that's fine the the way we run into issues is if people want to retroactively count hours from you know who knows what you know if there's no way for us to really account for it then obviously that's that's a no and that's an issue if they've spent time creating something that they're now using and they have documentation of that you know exactly what they did and how much time and you're fine signing off on that then that's okay are there any state licensing issues like with a person because they weren't technically under our supervision when they were developing it and then they join the supervision right halfway through like would that be a red flag for any of the specific states maybe tracy knows that i don't yeah yeah possibly i, I would say, I would yes. say it could be yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 okay that's so I guess there's yes, it's possible. And there's a caveat that that yes. might become a problem in certain states. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And that and really that caveat goes with a lot of those kind of gray areas. There are things that we accept at the BCNS that will not necessarily be accepted at a, you know, at a state licensure board. So just, you know, keep that in mind in those gray areas where we're like, mm, yeah, technically it would count, but you know, they, they could run into issues down the road. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Karen, can I just jump in? I would, yeah, I dumped something in the chat. Uh, I just, we do a lot of grand rounds, so I just want to understand specifically these are situations where they're partially will be sharing their own cases and working on them at other times of listening to others. Um, so do they need to break that time up between yeah. direct and like how does that count? It would count as time with a supervisor. So if you're doing grand rounds and there's say four candidates in the group and you're all discussing the cases, it would be considered time with supervisor. It's not direct or observational. And they can count the whole hour because they're in there participating with the supervisor. That's that's absolutely fine. So I know a lot of programs that will do a couple group sessions a month and then a you know one-on-one -on -one and count that as hours with supervisor. That's absolutely fine. Awesome. So follow up to that question. I know typically the ratio had been like one supervisor hour to 40 hours. Is that yeah. still the case or not? Because we like, so how did that fall into place there? We, yeah. So the reason we moved away from that language is because, you know, it is, you know, there are times when a candidate needs more than one hour per 40 hours. And there are times when maybe they don't need that much supervision. So really as a supervisor, that falls on you to decide what that looks like. Um, of course, it would be a big red flag to us if we got their report back and they had only spent four hours with their supervisor for a thousand hours. But really, that's up to you. So if, if you feel like they need more support in the beginning, maybe you're, maybe they're seeing you one hour for every 20 hours or, you know, and as they become better in their clinical work, maybe they're seeing you once every 50 hours. It's really up to you to decide what that looks like and what support they need and that they're meeting the competencies and you feel confident and signing off that they are meeting the requirements that we've that we set forward. Okay. Is there a red flag on too many hours with supervisor? That's a good question. So we don't we don't look for a maximum in that. So it would be like a red flag if there was 500 of their 1000 hours, but usually, you know, we see anywhere from you know, 50 to 120 usually it kind of just depends. Um so there could definitely be a red flag. I've never seen that come up. Um but we do look at the kind of the ratio if it was if it was that they were spending half of their time with the supervisor, then that would definitely, we would come back and question that. Yeah, thank as long you. As, it seems, very as, long helpful. as it seems realistic, then it's fine with us. Yeah, the, the rounds piece just plays a part because that's a regular weekly piece of, of yeah. uh, what we do, yeah. I have a question for you, Amy, hi. Um, at uh, NUNM, we have candidates who do externships and some of them might be in states where we may not be licensed or they um, might not have, they might be in a state that um, has a licensing requirement. Can we still supervise those candidates or is there a liability issue with that? You, anyone who is supervising or, let, let me word this correctly. If they're in a state that um, a, a supervisor is not licensed, they cannot count those hours. So technically they're okay. working under your license. So yeah. depending on the state, that might look differently. So some uh -huh. states, of course, don't have licensure laws. And so then that's absolutely fine. But for example, you know, if they're seeing clients in Maryland, 
where, where an LDN is required and you don't have a supervisor that's licensed in Maryland, then they cannot do that work because it, it, technically they're working under your license. How about if it's just observational? Can it can that count? No. OK. All right. Thank you. And is there a liability uh, document for supervisors uh, that the NA has crafted? We don't have one crafted. Um, and so at this point, we've just been you know, expecting that everyone is getting their liability insurance on their own. We don't have an actual drafted document. Tracy, is that something that we plan to do or have we kind of decided against that? I'm not sure. I don't think we have any plans to craft yeah. our actual document, but we do recommend that both supervisors and supervisees have their own liability insurance. Yeah. And Great. not only Thank recommend, you. we're having you sign off that that is actually a fact, so. Great. Thank you for that information. Okay. I'm going to finish walking through the tracker, but if any other questions come up, please feel free to let me know. Amy, while you're going back to that screen sharing, can I piggyback off of Kim's question? Because sure. I know that in previous conversations with you and Tracy, you were looking to craft something regarding our practicing rights in the different states that's a little more granular than the color-coded map. Um, do you have a timeline maybe to share? Because that could help us with determining you know, what candidates are eligible for supervision based on supervisor licensure. I'll let Tracy speak to that. I don't know where we're at with that. Yeah, um, actually, the first step is to make some updates to our map that's on the advocacy page. And then um, we're going to be updating the key and making some updates to the categories. So um, that's a work in progress. And as soon as we get the main key page up to date, and we're going to add some explanatory language about how we categorize things. And the reason we're doing that is because we get lots of questions about why does ANA say a certain state is green when the academy says it's red. Um, so I'm actually going through and comparing all of our states and working to update the category categories in a way that'll make sense. And then if there is a discrepancy between how we categorize a state and how the academy does it, I want to make sure there's language on our um, state pages that explains why we came to the conclusions that we did. Um, so that's a work in progress. And I think that what you might be talking about is we've talked about doing a more detailed supervisor's guide that would provide more of these detailed, you know, more detailed information about the specific states. Map is first, and then Amy and I'll be continuing to discuss the resources we have available for supervisors and what might be super helpful. Great. Thank you so much, Tracy. M most recently, my mind was blown when I looked at the California law in more detail regarding like a physician referral for yeah. medical nutrition therapy. I was like, I have never heard that in any conversation regarding <laughs> California. But then when you go to the law and you actually read it, there's that nuance. So I think things like that, if we could really have that information up front would be very helpful for candidates and supervisors because I'm, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving on to the next tab, which this, this is the self-evaluation tab. This is what the candidates report used to be. So it essentially looks the same way. I mean, it still has the same content that it used to have before. So we're asking them to rate themselves. Um, there's a drop down so they can rate themselves as significant, adequate, or minimal experience. And then they're going to describe the activities and examples that they did in that area. They can lay out any client materials that they might have created, and they're going to give us any details about MNT that they used. And this can be very general. So, for example, in the category, I'm sorry, in the example, it says, um, you know, to apply specific dietary and nutraceutical modifications as adjunct therapy in immunocompromised individuals. So, the example, they had adequate experience. Um, their activities and experience examples what they had worked with multiple clients undergoing chemo to support nu nutritional needs and manage side effects through nutrition, address depletions and side effects with chemo of chemo with supplements and botanicals, and, and then just put a note that they did not work with individuals with HIV, AIDS, or TB. And then, um, you know, list of handouts about uh, phytonutrients during chemo, provided education around the importance of sleep and stress management during chemo and after surgery, and then listed out some of the things that they use for MNT. So this can be kind of basic, but also, you know, as detailed as they want to be. So, 
you know, this is a great resource for them to also start putting together some of their, their go-to treatments for some of these things. So at the top category A, there may not be as much M and T and it does, you know, there doesn't have to be um, a detail in every category and every column. So some things there may not be M and T, but when you get down into the, um, the actual uh, health conditions, this would be a great place for them to map up uh, what they do with those clients and start creating, you know, a, a, almost a list of interventions. So we're looking for details on this, like we did the candidates report, you know, one sentence is not adequate. Uh, we're looking for, you know, several sentences that, that show us that they have met that competency. Um, again, we're looking for very few minimal experience. So obviously there are things that they may not encounter during their thousand hours and that's fine, but it is a big red flag to us if there's several of those things that they have minimal experience in because we're, we're expecting them to have a well-rounded uh, supervision experience and you know really cover these competencies. When you filled out your supervisor application, you checked off the same competencies and told us what you work on in your own practice. So we should see that pretty much align that they're getting a really well-rounded experience while they're being supervised. And then the final tab is really just for them. And this is just a place that they can put in health conditions that they um, have encountered. They could put in, of course, not client details, but you know things, maybe treatments, or they could just add notes there. This would maybe be a good place to start putting some stuff to study for the exam. But this tab is not required. It is just, it's absolutely optional and for them to just add any kind of notes that they might have. Any questions? Um, yeah, we're getting a bunch of questions about um, what defines level of experience. Mm -hmm. um, there seems to be some anxiety about how to determine the level of experience. Any yeah. guidance there? Um, so we're, you know, I think it becomes hard because we're asking them to evaluate themselves, right? And so that I think in itself creates some anxiety. Um you know, what we're expecting out of, you know, if if they're putting that they have um, significant experience, we're expecting that they're comfortable with that condition, that when they leave your supervision, they are, you know, seeing these people clinically and they feel absolutely comfortable taking that on. Adequate experience might be like, oh, I've, you know, I've seen this and I feel comfortable with it, but, you know, still maybe have some questions and minimal experiences. Essentially, they they don't feel comfortable doing that once they're out on their own. Does that help, Allison? Yes, I think it would probably be helpful to have something in writing or a guide. Okay. I think with all of these questions, I have been so helpful to hear the answers to some kind of visual guide yeah. that defines this for folks, I think would be really helpful. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to the um, to the forms real quick. Um, and just look at, you know, the supervisor report, we, we modified, we revised it. We didn't really change anything. The only thing is that we're, you know, having you clearly sign off on the expectations, which we laid out in the, um, the supervisor application, as well as what we're laying out as the responsibilities. Um, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. Um, so we're, you know, you're checking off the same things that you did on that application. And then we're asking for the actual hour breakdown, which we didn't used to do. So it used to be like a percentage thing. And so we felt like that we had kind of outgrown that. So we're asking you to essentially look at their tracker and the two should match. So when they're saying that they saw you from this date to this date on their tracker, we're, we're assuming that your report should say the same thing. Um, same thing with the one-on-one -on -one meetings. We're looking for the same numbers that they that they have on their tracker. Um, the breakdown of direct and observational hours, and then um, details on the setting. So that stuff's all the same. This is the main part that changed. We got rid of that percentage thing, and we're just asking for a breakdown of hours. And then at the uh, rating piece, um, before it, it allowed you to just put an E and not give any kind of details, but we're now asking for some details for every um, every line if possible. It doesn't have to be Again, it doesn't have to be a book, but at least a detail of, you know, if you're saying they that they exceeded requirements on this, what did that look like for you? Or if you're saying that they need improvement, what could that also look like? So um, there's there's not you know any other huge changes, um, the uh, you know on here other than that. Um, there is a separate supervisor report for academic degree programs. So if you're MUH, UB, um, SCNM. 
there is a different supervisor report for that. And so that's available on the website. If you're at one of those institutions and you don't have it yet or have any questions about it, please feel free to let me know. It's very similar. Um, it still has the, the percentage breakdown, but the, it's it's pretty much the same as it was before. We're just, we just kind of went through and revised a, a few things. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing and see, we still have about 10 minutes. See if anyone else, let's, I just wanna make sure that there was no questions in the chat. All right, any remaining questions? Amy, I have another question about the supervisor report on the total hours that you just mentioned is different. Mm -hmm. um, the, the group hours, the one-on-one -on -one hours, do you want the totals for their entire time with us in one-on-one yes. -on -one and group? Yes. It's not, okay. Um, and, and so- if you don't have that to this point, like don't feel like you have to backtrack to figure that out. But going forward, you know, it'd be great to have that breakdown. Um, so don't feel like you have to if you have candidates that you didn't know that we needed to separate them out. You don't don't feel like you have to go back and backtrack, but going forward, we do want a breakdown of what was one-on-one -on -one and what was a group setting. Okay. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tracy, do you have anything you want to add? I don't. I think you did a fantastic job of covering it. And I think this tool is really going to be helpful for all of our supervisors and our candidates. So thank you all for joining us and learning more about it. Eleonora? If you're able just to clarify, and uh, first of all, yeah, thank you. This was very helpful, great information. Um, so if I have a candidate that uh, they were like, they're just submitting now the paperwork, but I supervised them in 2020 or so. They are still okay with the old forms, yeah. correct? Yeah. Just anything that starting from September going forward, it's gonna be the new. Yes. So we're not asking anyone to go back and backtrack on anything. So, you know, if they if they were already using the old forms and it was in a time when you used the old forms, like a supervisor report or something, we're not asking anyone to redo any work. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, let me just check the chat and make sure we're good. Awesome. All right, so please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Oh, I was going to put in the chat two different things. Let me put that in here while everyone's here. Debbie and I both recorded a video um, when we released this uh, tracker. And so let me grab those links for everyone. And I'll send out a follow-up email too with the links in this recording to everyone. But here's- um, This is Debbie Slutsky, oops. manager of certification. And then um, that, this, these you can share with the links I'm giving you, the YouTube links, you can share those with your um, actual candidates. It's yeah. They're free to, to use those. And there's one that talks about the logistics of the form and then another that- um, it's just me walking them through filling out the form. Um, so feel free to share those with, with your candidates and we'll get them up on the website too. We just wanted to make sure we had walked through everything with everyone before we uh, made those public. Awesome, well, thank you so much everyone for joining us and I hope everyone has a wonderful Thanksgiving and holidays if I don't talk to you before then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.